You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hello, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year, all the holidays. Welcome to Olivia's Book Club, and I'm your host, Olivia Fierro, wishing you a very happy holiday season and like a slightly chill one, if that's possible, not talking necessarily about the weather, but about the mood because it is such a busy time and I know it can get a a little bit crazy. So I wanted to help out in any way that I could by giving you a couple of holiday recommendations if you are looking for a little uh, reprieve from the chaos of the holiday season and you want to feel the spirit, maybe you're a little grinchy and you need to kind of, you know, embrace the holiday mood in a more positive way a couple of recommendations for you because I've gone all in on all of the Lifetime and Lifetime style Hallmark movies on Netflix and everywhere else. So I'm kind of very much in the vibe. But I wanted to give you uh, maybe some ideas if you're not just yet. If you are struggling with gifting and you have some readers on your list, I immediately thought of a previous podcast guest of ours, Michelle Wallet's business is based here out of Arizona, Once Upon a Book Club. If you have not looked at this yet, it makes a phenomenal gift for the reader in your life. Whether it is a one-time box that you're ordering or the subscription service, you'll be completely startled as I was by how great these boxes are. I mean, they are big and they are so clever and the gifts you're opening as you go through the book um, and they tie in, I mean, from a clock on the wall when you're hearing, you know, that the the clock is striking whatever to maybe uh, the scent of the ocean that your character is, you're reading your character being out on the beach and you open a candle and it smells like the ocean. I mean, it is wild. I think it's the most genius business in the world. It's my number one thing I wish I would have thought of. Like, why didn't I think of that? So that's a great idea for a gift uh, this occasion or birthday or whatever. And you can do a subscription service once or uh, throughout the course of the year. Um, Also, if you're looking for some holiday reads, a previous podcast guest of ours, Miss Karen Shaler, who is known as Christmas Karen. Uh, She wrote The Christmas Prince, which is definitely queued up in your Netflix, I'm sure. Uh, She's got another one out. Her new one is called Love Always Christmas. And it's a story of a young woman who is having a tough time during the holiday season. She's definitely definitely feeling grinchy. She's without her mother and so she is just not feeling it and a mysterious letter kind of unlocks some magical holiday spirit and some uh, family and love and good feelings for the season. So that's a great one and a really quick read. That's out in paperback and it's also in audio. And she also has an original Audible that I've got queued up and I'm getting ready to listen to that I'm very excited about. It's called Love all, oh, no. Love Always Christmas is the other one. This one is called A Christmas Carol. Wait, let me get this right. Once Upon a Christmas Carol. So it's a play on the classic A Christmas Carol. And it's an Audible original that's acted out uh, by Ryan Pavey and also Brittany Presley, who is one of my favorite audiobook narrators. So if you do a lot of audio, you definitely know her. Uh, she's a television actress as well. But she is fantastic on audio. So she is the main character there. And it's that full cast. And it's only two hours and 17 minutes. So it's exactly like listening to a movie acted out by professional actors and so that's the kind of thing that will make you know uh, the driving around doing all of the errands and stuff go by really quickly or good for wrapping presents or taking a break from the non-stop holiday music so that's a great option for you as well um, on my own personal to be read list this holiday season is I cannot believe that I have never read this so this is from John Grisham skipping Christmas and it is the basis the inspiration for the movie which is one of my favorite holiday movies for Christmases with Reese Witherspoon and Vince Vaughn so if you like that movie uh, then you should read skipping Christmas and that's what I plan to do over the holiday season as well another one that is in my TBR that somehow I did not even know came out is Sophie Kinsella's Confessions Shopaholic, or I'm sorry, Christmas Shopaholic. And it came out in 2019. And it's, of course, the beloved character from the Shopaholic series, Becky Bloomwood. And now she's back. She's got it together. She is 
married and she's trying to pull off the perfect Christmas, you know, but can anybody pull off the perfect Christmas? And we know how Becky is an absolute riot. So, <laughs> so that is something that I've got to dive into. So I'm very, very excited about that. And then one that I always try to reread around this time of year is the master David Sedaris holidays on ice. He is just such a riot. And in particular, these short stories and essays hit a different note for me every single holiday season. So um, it's one that you can kind of just pick through. And I always think it's a fantastic gift if you're kind of um, in a situation where you're like, ah, I need something really quick or I don't know how what to buy so-and-so or even a host gift if somebody's having you over. It's short. It's great to have out for the holidays. It looks kind of cool. And it is so much fun. And he's just amazing. So love that. Um, those are some holiday recommendations for you, or you can always just completely zone out like I do watching uh, Lifetime, Hallmark, Netflix, whatever. Um, also speaking of a reread, I really wanted to take this opportunity to share with you an interview uh, that we did about this time period last year for the holiday season. It was the great Mary Kay Andrews. She was talking about her latest Christmas release. Of course, she writes so many beach reads and so many, I mean, so many favorites. She is an absolute beloved novelist. And last year she came out with The Santa Suit. And it was such a joy to talk to her. And I think that if you did not listen to that conversation or you're new to this podcast, you will very much enjoy hearing her talk about crafting this very sweet, very um, very relatable story, uh, The Santa Suit, about uh, a, a professional woman who's going through a divorce and kind of setting her life up in a small town. And it is just the kind of story that you enjoy about Christmas. It's full of heart and full of magic. And I also just found Mary Kay to be really an impressive and interesting woman full of joy and so many talents. And I was thinking about her increasingly this time of year, reflecting on that interview last year when she was really talking about family and how much she enjoyed her life as a mom and as a grandma and just as a creative person who makes magic during the Christmas time, uh, Christmas season for everybody in her circle. And sadly, I know that she has lost her daughter, Katie, over the last year. Uh, she passed away from cancer in February of uh, this year. So that was a really heartbreaking revelation that she shared with her readers and her fans. She's so, she's so loved all over. So I thought that listening, knowing um, the context of how much she loves her family and, and what she's now since gone through um, would be really worthwhile as we're approaching the holidays and all of the precious time that we maybe have with our loved ones. So uh, a, a perspective to share this holiday season. So here is an interview from 2021 with Mary Kay Andrews discussing the Santa suit. So Mary Kay, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on what what are you at now? Is it twenty nine published and then number thirty in a month or so? Or not, not a month because I'm still working on it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's uh, in the, heading in the direction of of thirty books, which is amazing to me. Wow, I mean it's incredible. And I know that you started out as a journalist, and here we are talking to you from. Um, the podcast studio upstairs from our newsroom here in Phoenix and, um, you know, the nitty gritty of daily journalism and, and telling a lot of tough stories and bad stories and people being mad at us about X, Y, and Z. And I love meeting former journalists who have transitioned into fiction writing and crafted these beautiful careers where you're just taking us away from the world that we need to escape <laughs> from um, and understanding kind of why we all need such an escape. So uh, do you remember back to that time period? Of course you do, but how you really felt when you were taking a leap and, and you know, spreading your wings in terms of, of writing something new? Yeah, I was terrified. I mean, I'm. I it's been thirty years, Olivia, but I still refer to myself as a recovering journalist. <laughs> I mean, I, and I, and certainly watching the events of the world, you know, now more than ever, it is it, it is a, a time period where everyone's evaluating and and saying uh, the value of our profession is wonderful. Um, but you know, it, it is exciting to fantasize about what might be next. And did you always have fictional stories brewing when you were? You know, meeting people, did you always kind of take note of, of who seemed to be captivating or could be, you know, a character in a page of your book? 
You know, I didn't really think for a long time that I would write fiction. I really loved journalism for so many years. I went to journalism school at the University of Georgia, and reporting was really what I dreamed of being. Um, I used to watch Superman because, I, and I didn't care about Superman. I wanted to be Lois Lane. <laughs> I wanted to rush into the newsroom and say, Stop the I've got a hot story. But, you know, journalism changed. They didn't ask my permission. Um, so I, you know, my kids were young and I thought I want to still write, but I would love to be home when my kids got home from school. They were four and eight when I left the newspaper world. Um, but, you know, the I still, to this day, use a lot, little bits and pieces of stories that I've stashed away in my brain end up. Um, sneaking their way into the books. And in fact, my first published novel, which was Every Crooked Nanny, um, I got the idea from that from a story I wrote for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. That is so great. And I've been just really tickled to meet so many of the authors that we've been able to to profile here on this podcast who had a background in journalism. And so it's just those little storytelling elements and um, we're mutually curious people, right, that go into that profession. You mean nosy? Nosy, exactly. Well, you were justifiably nosy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, back then I had a I had an excuse for being nosy, and now I just tell. And now when I go to a party and people start telling stories, and I do this, mm. my husband will sneak up behind me and say, "Hey, be careful! She'll put you if you don't watch out, she'll put you in a book." <laughs> I'm sure that anybody would be quite flattered to be in the pages of one of your books. So let's talk about the Santa suit. I mean, it is, it's a great gift to get somebody to just get ready to dive into the holiday spirit. And of course, we're always inundated with a lot of films and television shows that are Christmas. And certainly the music is nonstop starting really early. But yeah. I have not had the pleasure of enjoying a lot of Christmas themed books in the past for, for me personally on my reading list. So this was a delight. Um, talk to our listeners about Ivy and the Four Roses farmhouse and um, all that she is encountering in this special season. Ivy has just come out of a bad divorce. She's been living in Atlanta, running a marketing company with her now ex and she's bruised and battered and she decides she needs a do over. Um, on a spur of a moment, she decides she needs to pull up roots from Atlanta. And so she goes online. She decides she wants to live in an old white farmhouse in the mountains. She goes online and she finds this beat up old farmhouse. It looks mag magical online. Four Roses Farm, she buys it without ever stepping foot inside of it. She pack packs up her dog, Pumpkin. And the week before Christmas, she arrives at Four Roses Farm in a small town in the mountains of North Carolina. And um, there's a man standing in the driveway, a strange man, and he introduces himself as Ezra, her real estate agent. And of course, she didn't meet Ezra because everything was conducted online, as so many sales were during the pandemic. And um, of course, she thought Ezra, when you hear the name Ezra, she pictured him as an you know 80-year-old wearing a sweater vest and bow tie. But this is not that Ezra, Olivia. This is hot Ezra. <laughs> And he takes her inside the house and he tells her, and she knew that she was buying the house from an estate, that the former owners were, were long deceased. But what she didn't realize was that they'd left everything. And so the house is full of lumpy old lady furniture that Ivy wants no part of. And um, he takes, Ezra takes her through the house and um, they go into her, what will be her room and the closet is full of old lady clothes. And she starts pitching them aside because she needs to hang up her own clothing on the top shelf of the closet she finds a beautifully wrapped christmas box and she takes it down and lifts the lid and inside she finds a beautiful red velvet vintage santa suit and ezra explains to her that bob and betty ray rose who owned four roses farm were for four decades mr and mrs santa claus for this community um, every year they decorated Four Roses Farm with thousands of twinkling white lights and people came from miles around all over the mountains to see um, White Rose Four Roses Farm lit up and they played Mr. and Mrs. Claus in the Christmas parade and Bo Santa Bob was the Santa at the department store and they were Mr. and Mrs. Claus uh, in the Christmas parade. So um, they were a local institution and, and Ezra looks at Ivy and says, You'll, you'll light up the house too, right? And 
Ivy says, absolutely not. He wants no part of Christmas this year. Christmas has sort of a sad connotation for her because of something that happened in her childhood. And also because she just wants to keep her head down and get through Christmas, just wants to get over it. But Four Roses Farm has other plans. So that night she's putting the Santa suit away. She decides she'll give it away to charity or to the family. And she finds a note in the pocket and it's in a child's handwriting. And it says, dear Santa, my mommy is sad all the time. All I want for Christmas is for you to bring my daddy home from the war. Signed your friend, Carlette. And of course, Ivy decides she has to find out who was Carlette? Did her daddy come home from the war? And why did Santa, out of the thousands of letters he must have gotten over the years, why did he save this particular Santa letter? And so that's a little bit about the story. Um, Ivy, as soon as she starts delving into the past, finds herself um, surrendering to Christmas. She can't help but surrender to it. She has no, she has no intention of doing Christmas, but Christmas has other ideas this year. <laughs> well, and it's funny. I was actually just talking about the book last night with a girlfriend of mine. And I was saying what I really loved about Ivy is, I mean, she has been through the ringer. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard enough to, I'm sure lick your wounds after a divorce and, and plan the, their personal life rebounding all of that but the fact that her business and she is a very you know serious bright focused businesswoman that that right. gets all mixed up in and kind of taken and disrupted from her as well because they had been working together um but she is in no way a victim and she is no way in um the habit of feeling sorry for herself she just seems to be kind of a doer like a i'm going to move forward kind of gal yeah i think and when she arrives in this in this small town um, she really thinks she can do exactly what she intends to do, which is just power through Christmas. Um, she's not going to get involved in anything. But when her business, you know, when she finds out her whole life is upended and it's been basically the rug's been pulled out from underneath of her, she suddenly finds herself making connections. She in this little town, in this community that she didn't intend to make. And I think that's what happens to so many women. You know, we are... Um, we get out and do things. We don't let things happen to us. We happen to other people. And that's what <laughs> I mean. So you know, though, Mary Kay, you're setting up a situation where people are going to read this book and think, oh, you know what I need to do is just relocate and guaranteed the first person I meet, I mean, maybe my real estate agent, maybe it'll be the, the first contractor that comes by or whatever, is going to be the handsome hunk of the town. I mean, it is pretty easy for her. <laughs> Well, let's face it, it's Christmas. <laughs> and I think a Christmas book needs to have magic woven throughout it. And so um, that's my excuse. And my other <laughs> excuse is that when I started writing this book, it was exactly a year ago. I had handed in my book for this past summer, which was The Newcomer, and it, it was locked down. There was nowhere to go, nothing else to do. And so I started some writer friends and I started talking about Christmas books. And I said, I'm not writing a Christmas book. I've written Christmas books. I'm not doing it. But then I was driving back to Atlanta from, we have a beach house on Tybee Island outside of Savannah. And the idea for the Santa suit kind of crept into my mind. And I started thinking about it. And what I really wanted to do was, it was such a dark time for all of us. Um, I really wanted to put a little light in the world. I wanted to... Um, create sort of a snow globe. Um, and so the world of the Santa suit is like a, it's like a snow globe. And I want to invite my readers in to, you know, um, enjoy the magic of that time. That's a great analogy because who doesn't want to be inside the snow globe, right? I mean, we're fascinated by it and we love it. And, and you're taking us away and it, it feels good and it's so enjoyable. And, and I will say, and it won't spoil one, won't spoil anything. It, it, it has a substantive plot that was very satisfying too. There's a lot of elements and a lot of relationships um, that play out in this book, which is uh, relatively short. You describe it as a novella, right? Yeah, yeah, it's relatively short. Um, um, I think at Christmas we're so overwhelmed with all the rushing around and yeah. things we have to do. I thought I just want to write something that you know maybe you read a few chapters every night before you doze off to sleep, or 
you know, maybe, um, maybe you do sit down, make, maybe you make a fire in the fireplace. Um, I don't know if you make fires in the fireplace in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> we do. They're gas and we get yeah, worried but, about making sure that everything is yeah. working well, but yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I just wanted, I wanted, that's what I wanted. I wanted to give my readers, um, uh, an appetizer, a, a delicious, sweet peppermint scented goodie oh. of a book. Fantastic. Uh, definitely got me feeling in the spirit. It was just super fun to read. Um, I do want to talk to you about your friends, your friends in fiction. You're talking about, yeah. how, oh my gosh, how you were how you were feeling and approaching this at the start of the pandemic. We had that chance to talk to Kristen Harmel earlier in this year and, and just about these fabulous ladies coming together. And I mean, now you're just this powerhouse venture of all of these elements. I was thinking in particular about you, if we were to list, you know, all of your hyphenates, I, we would be here all day, right? I mean, podcaster, novelist, journalist, mom, a renovator, treasure hunter, <laughs> cook, right? I mean, a on and on and on. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, first of all, in general, I want you to rank some of these titles for me of like what takes up the most time and then what gives you the most secret pleasure. But this, this group of, of women and what you're doing is so remarkable. So talk to me about how it's been for you and, and, and the evolution. Well, it started really in um, March of the when the lockdown happened. Um, there were um, there were a group of us. Um, there were five at the time. Um, we were all novelists. We all had books coming out in the spring and summer, and all of a sudden, we got the um, the the plug was pulled on all of our book tours, and so we started talking. We knew each other through each other, and so we started talking online about what we could do. And I said, well, why I've got a zoom account. Why don't we do a zoom happy hour and let's talk about how we could promote our books and also what we could do to help independent bookstores because they had had to close their doors like so many other small businesses. And, um, so we did that and we tossed some ideas around and I said, well, you know, um, I had, a, I've got a pretty sizable Facebook following. And so I said, why don't we do, I don't know, a Facebook live program on Wednesday nights and call it, I don't know, friends in fiction. Cause I like alliteration. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what we did. We were sort of like, you know, Judy Garland. Hey kids, my dad's got a barn. Let's put on a show. <laughs> and the first show, um, we did not know what we were doing. My daughter, Katie was running tech. And if you watch the first show, you can see her crawling out of the camera range because she just turned on my ring light. And uh, it was disastrous. <laughs> I, the first show, and you can see it, um, we're archived on, on uh, Facebook and also on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. I'm in my satin pajamas because I didn't think anyone would be watching. <laughs> and it took off in a way we never anticipated. You know, uh, we looked up and we had a thousand Facebook members and we were like, wow, this is amazing. You know, we're only going to do this for six weeks, but it's incredible. And then we looked up and we had 5,000 and then 10,000. And now we're, I think we're over 55,000 members on our Facebook page. So we do a live webcast every Wednesday night. Um, we talk to different authors. We talk to best-selling authors. We talk to emerging authors. We're making a real, we're making a real effort to have inclusive uh, inclusiveness in our guests, to have some diversity in our guests. At first, we didn't like men. We were a no boys allowed club, but now we've opened the, the, the guys can come in and play in our treehouse. Oh my gosh, that's very generous of you. We have to make room for everybody, right? Sometimes. <laughs> Not all the time. Uh, well, yeah. it, it's just like we were talking about Ivy and about women being a doer. I mean, that is a time period when many of us were just sitting and drinking wine and weeping silently and pouting oh, about. We were the... doing that too. <laughs> okay, good. I feel better. <laughs> but you I first talked about calling it drinking wine with strangers on the internet, but it was too long. <laughs> not as catchy. No alliteration. Oh, no. <laughs> not not for a group of writers. You must get uh, a great satisfaction out of. Okay, for, well, first of all, um, to to have the idea to move it forward rather than playing catch up as you see other people kind of you know creating this space online. I mean, your your timing was right, and the chemistry 
of being like-minded people who are have the passion for storytelling and for all of the things that involve, you know, book community. Um, you know, and I, I imagine that there are many writers who were sort of forcing themselves to get into social media, dip a toe in for the first time during all of this. So, I mean, weren't you way ahead of the curve? Was there a, one of these much younger writers that you had to kind of handhold and walk the route of um, tech and social? <laughs> Oh, the, the younger writers, Chris, you know, the, the, there are four of us now, so it's myself, Patty Callahan, Henry, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Kristen Harmel, who you've talked to. Um, Christy is the same age as my son. <laughs> and she is the most business savvy woman I've ever met. Mm -hmm. She has a degree in journalism and she also has a degree in finance. So the great thing about it was we all brought our different, our different strengths mm -hmm. to the table. Um, and the other great thing about it is it's a mutual admiration society. Mm -hmm. We not only like each other, we admire each other and we, and we're really proud of what, you know, what we've been able to do. Honestly, we really thought six, six weeks, give it six weeks and, you know, we'll all be back out on the road and we'll write our books. And, and so when that didn't happen, we really had to look at each other and say, are we going to keep doing this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer, I'm, yes, I, I hope yes, no matter what's going on in your lives. And it's it's an incredible platform to be able to share stories and, and to highlight other storytellers. And especially, as you mentioned, um, also bring some attention to these local bookstores. There is, it seems to be, an important friendship that can form between writers. Um, is it because it can be a lonely profession or is it because um, the process of, of getting through a story or, or dealing with a deadline is so unique that you really need somebody who's familiar with it to, to be able yeah. to hear you and, and, and give you feedback? It's all of those things. I mean, yeah, it's a very, it's a very solitary profession. I'm on deadline now. I'm fast. In fact, I'm five weeks past deadline. So I'm locking myself up in the carriage house above our garage <laughs> writing and but the the one um outside you know my helpline are my girlfriends who write my the other friends in fiction authors we have a text chain going almost every morning who's writing how many words have you written and so it's sort of you know we they've been through the same kinds of things i've been through that are maybe not as easy for my other civilian friends to understand well why can't you go to lunch why can't you go come just come have a glass of wine i'm like well if I have a glass of wine, I won't write my words. I gotta write <laughs> <laughs> at least not the words I want to write. <laughs> oh, no, words yet. I I have my they have to my editor likes them to make sense. <laughs> oh gosh, coherent thoughts, it's so much pressure. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, I think as I was reading your bio, I mean, I was thinking, is this the most interesting lady on the planet? Because you do, as I mentioned, have so many interests and, and things that you obviously excel at. I mean, you also have published a cookbook. You also mentioned your home on the islands and you have rental properties that you really are in charge of these projects start to finish. So what, where is this? <laughs> like, they don't let they don't let you be in charge, but don't you do you pick stuff you you scout out? Yes. Okay. It's a team effort. My husband and I have redone. I don't know how many old houses. I like junky old houses and he puts up with it. So we have remodeled, I don't know, six or seven now. And we've now done three on Tybee, this funky, junky little beach town outside of Savannah. It's like the last funky little beach town on the East coast, I think. And, um, so we buy them and we fix them up. My husband is really handy, can do a lot of that work, but we have really have general contractors who do the work. And then in the, while he's fixing it up, I'm out scouting thrift stores and junk piles and estate sales um, for vintage stuff to put in the houses. And so, you know, um, my children accuse me of buying real estate to support my junking habit. <laughs> and they're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> They're not wrong, but whatever it is, however, whatever the motivation is, it's working and it's satisfying for you. Yeah, I, you know, I do it because I love it. And it, I don't think it works if, it, if you're not, don't have a passion for it. And that includes um, writing, it includes cooking, it includes, you know, fixing up old houses. And um, we really love sharing them with our guests. I mean, we have guest books in each of the houses. And the first thing I do when we go down, when the, when we have a vacancy is I open those guest books and I, and I love hearing from our guests about what they liked about their stay and about the houses. That is so cool. And I imagine that you have a lot of your readers 
anxious to stay in these spaces and be able to leave you a note and I can know that you you you've helped to, to create this space. Yeah, we've been really fortunate. The houses have, have, have proven to be pretty popular. It's got to be like a, the perfect book club retreat, right? I mean, <laughs> it's the ultimate brand extension. <laughs> right? I mean, right. It's just, it's, it's marketing genius and branding in so many different ways. Uh, the cooking also. So as we're approaching the holidays, what is your, I mean, amongst the many things that you do, what would you say your favorite traditions are that are so important for you to, to keep going with, with your family, even as busy as your life may be, that they look forward to, to you um, kind of leading the way with? Well, you know, of course, gathering around the table. We'll be gathering around our table here at Thanksgiving with our extended family. Um, they know I'm going to go overboard decorating the house. Um, they know I'm going to stand outside yelling at my husband because he's up on a ladder and I don't want him up on a ladder hanging those lights. Um, and they know I'm just going to fling Christmas everywhere and they're going to get dragged into it. We, um, you know, I put on my Christmas music and I, my husband puts the lights on the tree and then I'm in charge of the rest of it. And we bring up bins and bins and bins of the vintage Christmas I've collected over the years and um, it's plaid and it's shiny and it's tacky and um, it's fun. We have two grandchildren who live around the corner, so they're a big part of our lives. We'll bake cookies um, and decorate them. They love to bake, so we'll do a lot of that. Um, and it's just fun. Oh, don't you want to move in with her? It's like the ultimate, this is the ultimate holiday scenario right now. That you're, you're, The picture that you're painting is just so good. But while you're enjoying Christmas and your readers might be enjoying the Santa suit still and staying in theme, you're already well ahead into next summer's release, right? Yeah, in fact, I'm overdue with next, I'm pregnant with book, you might say. <laughs> So, I mean, it must be uh, as experienced as you are, and, and you mentioned the deadlines and being slightly overdue, which I can't imagine, you know, your editor is giving you too much pressure since they know how prolific and uh, successful your novels are. But does it ever still at this point in your career get a little nerve wracking if it's not flowing in the way that you might have had, say, the last time or the time before? It's terrifying. It's, tearing, it's terrifying every time. Every time I am overwhelmed with uh, in uncertainty and self-doubts and self-loathing and I type a sentence and then I delete it or I write something down in my handy notebook and I scratch through it. Um, and, and, and that doesn't change even after 30 books. Um, the only thing that has changed is the one thing I know for certain is that I feel like this every book. My family reminds me, you are like this every time. You will finish this book. You will. And I have all my book jackets framed uh, and hung on my office walls. Not to show off because I don't let anybody in there. It's a mess. But to remind myself, you did this before. You're going to do it again. Well, that is a smart visual. Yeah, because even even when you even when you know that you can you can do it and everybody loves what you do um, still, it is good to know that that's a relatable sense, uh, even among such a successful person in, in your industry. Um, every time I talk to the two writers who we admire so much and we just we do this because we love books and love sharing them and love sharing them with our, our viewers here in the newscasts and and all of that and sharing a book club with them. What do you say, what do you remember about the moment when you really fell in love with the reading? Because, you know, that's when it all starts, right? When you're absorbing somebody else's story and you're like, wow, there's some magic in here. Yeah, I was the second oldest of five kids and my mom had five kids in seven years. So she was a busy lady and she would um, get my older sister, who was 20 months older than me, to read to me to make me be quiet. And my sister got fed up with it. And so she started teaching me to read. I was reading before first grade. And I, the magic of books, I don't think it's ever, um, it's never dimmed for me. I can remember opening um, a Dr. Seuss. I love Dr. Seuss. I love the playful language. And the I love the humor and the whimsy of it. And so I had another friend in first grade who was also reading um, before he started school and we would race each other to the school library to pick out books. And we, and we had a, such a great first grade teacher who, who knew that allowing us that huge privilege 
would only make us love books more. And it, and it still has to this day. Oh, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Those, there's little moments and then shaping a career and then your books influencing somebody else to aspire to maybe put a story down on paper. It is, um, it's got to be very fulfilling. So thank you so much for sharing um, today. This is just a wonderful experience to be able to talk to you and especially also um, to know that you're sharing in the way that you all are with Friends in Fiction. It is just really cool to see such a creative venture and, and, you know, very successful women banded together and, and all of the many interests that y'all have together. So it is a wonderful experience to observe. Thank you, Olivia. And yeah, so I hope everybody will check us out on Wednesday nights. We have, um, we're on Facebook, we have a YouTube channel, and we're going to have our 100th episode wow. next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ellen Hildebrand on as our special guest for our 100th episode. So it's crazy. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun, even when there's yeah. a global pandemic, because you're able to write fiction. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what we all need to survive, a lot of fiction. Mary yeah. Kay Andrews, thank you so, so very much. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. And the book is The Santa Suit. Uh, loved it. Can't wait for the next. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub, and Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.